You're listening to the Complete Human Podcast, hosted by co-founders Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We share authentic conversations about wellness, longevity, personal growth, and bio-optimization, along with inspiring stories that encourage community and social responsibility. We hope you enjoy this episode. From the Latin words for life and best, bio-optimization in the form of the complete human four principles represents a constant feedback loop using data to make small corrections that lead to big changes over time. But how do we collect that data? Let's go back in time to 1945 when Dick Tracy first hit the airwaves. A detective story on TV was nothing new, but what sparked widespread conversation was the technology that PI Dick Tracy had at his disposal, including a radio watch. As the science fiction evolved, the wearable device evolved as well, going far beyond a mere communications portal. Wearable devices are now commonplace, allowing users to send and receive calls and texts, get reminders, track workouts and daily steps. In the battle of wearable devices, the contest for consumers seems to be driven by how many features can be packed into a single unit. But for one company, their focus is on true health and wellness, replacing more widgets for better data, data that drives real day in and day out behavior. Today we interview VP of Performance Science Kristen Holmes. Her experience in the world of biometric research is unparalleled and today we get to discuss the science behind WHOOP, why the data is so valuable, and how that knowledge is giving clear insights on how to train, recover, and sleep. Ladies and gentlemen, Kristen Holmes. Hey ladies and gentlemen, has COVID left you feeling a little off your performance game? Do you wonder if you're truly healthy? We did a lot. Training looks a lot different than it did a year ago, and having a tool that really gives us valuable insights to improve our health and performance was essential. Whoop and their new Whoop 3.0 has the technology and the science to evaluate your sleep, training, and recovery, and provide valuable insights on how to improve real health and performance. Their HRV and respiratory rate calculator has even been shown to predict a COVID-19 infection. Now, more than ever, we need real tools to monitor and improve our health. That's why we are excited to offer Complete Human listeners this great deal. Go to join.whoop.com slash complete human for a $30 discount. That's join.whoop.com slash complete human for a $30 discount. Hey, hey guys, Jana Breslin here again. Most of you have heard me speak on the benefits of beets. Beets are well known as a powerful superfood and help the body create nitric oxide, the miracle molecule that supports a healthy cardiovascular system and sexual function. As an athlete, the nitric oxide boosting benefits help me power through workouts better than any artificial pre-workout I've ever taken. Now, this is why we created Complete Human Res Beet. You get all of the benefits of organic beets with additional anti-aging support from fermented resveratrol. Resveratrol is a longevity gene activator and is something I have turned to for years to help support anti-aging and optimal health. If you're not a fan of the taste of beets, we've got you covered with our all natural and delicious dark cherry flavor. I take Resbeet twice a day and I have to say, I feel incredible. Head on over to store.completehuman.com and enter the code podcast at checkout to get 20% off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of the Complete Human Podcast with your host, Jana Breslin, and Evan DeMarco. Today we get to talk to, if you guys didn't pay attention to the intro, Kristen Holmes, who is the VP of uh, Performance Science over at Whoop. As we said uh, before you guys uh, jumped into this podcast, we are going to seriously geek out today. Mm -hmm. I'm already stoked. All the science. All the science. (laughs) Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So give our audience a little bit of background on who you are, what WHOOP is, and what the VP of Performance Science does on a daily basis. Sure. Uh, Yeah. So my, I guess my background is in uh, coaching and teaching. I played on the U.S. national team for seven years. So I competed at Olympic level, played a couple sports in college. um, So I was a Big Ten athlete. Um, So my whole life has been centered around performance, right? And, And I guess my my whole academic career and and on the applied side has really been about unpacking the, you know, both the physiological and psychological aspects um, that really influence our ability to perform at our highest level. So, you know, that has been really kind of my, my life's work. And then, you know, I think going, uh, what attracted me to whoop is that, you know, you can, 
you can talk about some of these measures that that influence performance all day long. Um, I think you know, sleep comes to mind. But if if you're not really quantifying it, it's really hard to understand where to apply your effort. And you know, I think that's one of the the areas that I, I'm really interested in is 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 understanding you know where to apply our effort. And there's just a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of information out there. I think it's hard for folks to understand what to actually grasp onto as it relates to moving their trajectory in a meaningful way, you know, the, the health and longevity trajectory. So I think, you know, wrestling to the ground, um, you know, those, what are those core behaviors and then what we actually need to measure has been um, really the subject of, of my interest and, and really where I've applied a lot of my effort in, in terms of my academic life. Um, and then, you know, the work that I do at WHOOP kind of all kind of puts that together in a nice, a nice bow, you know, I get to do a ton of research with external partners, again, trying to understand, you know, what do these behaviors look like? If we know that our capacity to, you know, adapt to external stress is really important, well, what are the behaviors that contribute positively to that? And doing research to, to better understand um, what those behaviors are is, is really where I spend a bulk of my time at WHOOP. And then helping folks interpret, um, you know, their, their data to, you know, optimize their performance related to strain, sleep, and recovery. So it's kind of, I guess, in a snap, uh, a quick snapshot, like my background and, and where I've spent a lot of my time. Nice. So, you know, we first heard about Whoop. Well, you, you've known about it for a while, but I mm -hmm. heard about it at the Spartan last year. And mm -hmm. I think it's obviously blown up quite a bit since then. But I think one of the things that like most guys, you know, it, this is kind of the ultimate guy concept is like, okay, you're going to go into a lab and you're going to create all of these measurements that dictate what we need to, to almost be the perfect specimen. So how do you do that? How, how does a group of scientists get together and say, this is what we're going to measure. And this is why we know that these variables are the things that kind of lead us to the best performance outcome. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's, I, I think there's, you know, a fair amount of science around specific behaviors that that tell us, okay, these are the ones that we probably need to think about. <laughs> um, so I, I think as as a scientist, like, I'm really interested in, in, you know, creating a protocol that helps us say, you know, definitively that, hey, yeah, these are the things that we should do in order, you know, if we want to. Um, sleep better, for example, we know, you know, sleep is really important to human performance, right? So, but just saying sleep is important isn't enough, right? We need to understand the behaviors that contribute to optimal sleep. So I think in terms of, you know, creating this perfect specimen or whatever your goal is, is it's you have to understand the, 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 the behaviors that actually influence these markers that we're tracking, right? It's not just about being good at sleep. It's about actually performing at a higher level, right? At your highest potential. Right. I mean, if that's of interest of you, to you, then you need to understand the, the actually the, the suite of behaviors that are going to most influence your sleep behavior or your sleep potential, um, your potential for quality sleep. So I, I guess that's that's as a scientist, that's what we're trying to unpack, and and that's what really we're aiming to deliver with Whoop is all right. What are these suite of behaviors, and then okay, we can measure the efficacy of those behaviors by giving you quantified insight into how your body, you know, what's actually happening in these moments of, of sleep, in these moments of adaptation, which is recovery, or in these moments of cardiovascular load, which is strain. That makes sense. And so those are the, the key things that you guys focus on with your technology is strain, sleep, recovery, um, mm -hmm. HRV. You guys actually track a lot of different things. Can you go into like all the different components of that? Yeah, we, we do track a lot of stuff, um, but yeah, you're right. We've got these three pillars that, you know, we basically um, are collecting heart rate data, you know, we accelerometer. Um, so we're collecting huge amounts of data. And I think that's really what, you know, separates us. And what I love about Whoop is that there's really, there's nothing on the, on the you know, worn on the wrist in the market um, that has as much granular data as, as we do. We're, we're and, and as a high fidelity, we're collecting, you know, 52, Hertz. So it's basically 52 times a second heart rate data. Data. We're not. There's no watch face. So we're not powering down to like answer a, a text message or make a phone call. Or so as a result, we're, we just get massive amounts of data, and that data enables us to say something really meaningful about what's happening with your body. Um, and you know, we our our point of view is that we want to understand not just what you did, but your response to what you did, um, and then. 
the foundation of everything is, is sleep behavior, right? It's the most important behavioral experience. So we wanna break that down into the most granular level possible. So you can, again, understand what are the behaviors that I need to engage in to actually improve my sleep performance, you know, sleep performance being really, you know, the, the, the kind of the keys to the kingdom or the keys to performance, right? If you're not sleeping well, you just have simply adapted to a lower level of performance. And what's so sneaky with sleep is you can't necessarily perceive your own cognitive and physical declines. It's just the, the bottom line, right? We know this from all the literature that exists. You're not going to be able to know when you've just adapted to a lower level of functioning. So at our core, I think that's what WHOOP prevents is that we give you like real insight into how you're actually adapting to external stress. And that's really what WHOOP recovery is. Um, and, you know, strain is the summary statistic of cardiovascular load. Um, so in terms of recovery, I think you started to allude to heart rate variability and, and some of the components that make up our, our, the recovery algorithm. Um, I think it's important to, for folks to understand that, you know, while we track heart rate variability, we track resting heart rate, we track, um, respiratory rate and sleep performance. And those are the four inputs that make up recovery. Um, what we've seen in all the research that we've done externally, uh, and internally is that no single one of those markers independently are more predictive of performance than they are together. So whoop recovery gives you a snapshot of how your body is adapting to external stress. And those four inputs are algorithm that puts together those, those four inputs, calculates it and puts it together um, is, is really predictive of all sorts of different performance metrics. So we've been able to prove this out in ice hockey, um, you know, efficiency on, on the ice. We've been able to prove this in exit bat velocity, exit ball velocity, um, free throw percentage, um, swim times in pool on the track, shooting range, um, and just clearing houses. Uh, you know, we work a ton with Naval Special Warfare, um, with, you know, special operations. Um, so we're able to basically, we've been able to prove that whoop recovery um, correlates, you know, very strongly with all these performance metrics that people care about. Mm -hmm. That is so cool. Yeah. It's so unique too, because it's, it's, when I compare it to something like Fitbit or any of the, uh, these other like wearable technologies, those are counting, they're, they're counting steps. They're like, it's almost like, you know, how, how, how far can you go? How many steps can you take? Um, but with whoop, it's, it's really about, um, preventing you from overtraining or harming yourself in the future. It's such a different way to view health and fitness and tracking your, your performance. Yeah. I mean, you know, step counting is just simply not a reliable measure of your activity level. So yeah, um, yeah. I think, you know, just to put it really simply um, and bluntly, but, um, but yeah, you know, you're so right. It it's, it's all about understanding your capacity level, right? Like you're rather than just arbitrarily going out there and just doing a workout, having an understanding of what your body is capable of doing that day is will dictate whether or not you're actually able to capitalize on that training, right? When we're, when we're undertaking volume and intensity in a way that our, our body can't adapt to it, um, we're, we're just wasting our, our time, right? And, and I go back to my first principle of how do we apply our effort, mm -hmm. right? And, and this is where these data come in to, to really help us understand how to, to actually literally apply our effort, right? As it relates to working out, right? How much volume and how much intensity am I gonna put on my body? Well, how much, what is my physiological intent? Okay, and that's the other layer just deeper inside WHOOP is that it's not just, you know, okay, I'm taking on strain, you know, it's on a scale of zero to 21 and it's dictated based on, you know, what, uh, you know, heart rate zone you're in. And we have a whole calculation going in the background that basically helps us map that onto the scale that gives you a sense of, of, you know, how much strain you've built that day. Um, but it's really, it's understanding, you know, if I want to get fitter, for example, if that's my goal, how do I overreach in a, in a way that is functional, right? How do I overreach? Because you have to put stimulus on your body, right? In order to elicit, uh, enough of a, uh, stress in order to create a fitness gain. So I think that's where, you know, whoop is just the like next level, right? Is, is that we help you understand like what that speed, sweet spot of kind of functionally overreaching actually is. So you can make these fitness gains without like running yourself into the ground. Right. And I think that's, that, that is the magic of this platform. Frankly, if, I mean, there's so many, there's so many bits of magic, but I think if you're someone who's really trying to get fitter, like that's what we help you do. You know, taking 10,000 steps is, it might make you fitter, might, might not, like, how do you even know, right? Like that, that's just a, a very, it's a very arbitrary way of, of thinking about it. Whereas this is a very 
quantify tactical way of thinking about how to make fitness gains in a way that you work with your, your body. Um, and over time, like you, you know, do this over and over again, you build your capacity, right? Because you're not digging yourself, you're not digging into like this hole physiologically that, you know, you're just basically constantly fighting against your body. The, the technology clearly is fascinating. So I, I kind of want to unpack a couple of the pieces because we've spoken a little bit about HRV um, on this show, and especially as it pertains to like the iHeart device. Um, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's got, you know, it, it's basically a pulse oximeter and you put it on your finger and it measures HRV. And then based off of their algorithm, they'll quantify your cardiovascular age versus your chronological age. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I found this very interesting because I've prided myself on this damn device of, <laughs> of, of recognizing that as a 41 year old, I typically show up on this iHeart at around 22 to 23 cardiovascular wise. But then when I got my readings from my whoop on HRV, it said that my numbers were like 42 or 43, which seemed to be in, in kind of stark contrast to what the information that I've been given from another device. So I'd love for you to tell our audience a little bit about what HRV is and then how do you guys quantify that? And then let's figure out as, as a bunch of scientists why my numbers are a little squirrely here. Well, also okay. you just started wearing that too. Okay. I'm just saying like, it's, I don't know if it takes more time to calibrate or kind of measure, but yeah, devices, it's hard to measure. It's hard to compare um, devices. It's not apples to apples. They could be using a different method to um, transform our intervals and give you, uh, you know, a, a reading of our HRV. So um, not to get too crazy in math. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know this. I, I know these types of technology that are, are measuring from the ear and the finger and I've had experience with them, but um, I don't actually know exactly how they're calculating HRV. So it could be just a different way. Um, you know, they could be log transforming it. Like there's all different types of ways to, um, you know, to calculate heart rate variability. I think what's important is that the time frame of when you're taking a reading, that's really, really important. And all of the literature that's emerged in the last decade, um, you know, from very, very reputable, you know, journals with, you know, very rigorous, you know, uh, protocol have shown that the time frame of if you want to get an accurate measure of next day capacity, okay, so we're not talking about you know your age necessarily, your chrono, you know your chronological versus your biological age, but we're talking about measuring next day capacity because that's really the device that you're talking about. Like that's different than what we're doing, right? We're trying to tell you what is your ability, um, you know what what is your ability to adapt to stress. Right, that's that's what we're trying to quantify, uh, and that's what we're measuring with with heart rate variability. But I think the time frame of when you're taking this measurement is really important. If you're taking heart rate variability during the day, um, there are a lot of confounding variables that influence that reading, and you know how you go into taking that test today could be very different than how you went into taking that test yesterday, and how different it's going to be from when you go in to take the test tomorrow. And what makes heart rate variability such a cool marker is that it is really sensitive, right? And um, it, and as a result, it picks up on all the perturbations that are happening inside your body. And if you take it during the day, you measure heart variable during the day, it's going to be sensitive to all of those perturbations. So whether you, you know, went to the bathroom, whether you're, you know, if you're thinking about, um, you know, the date that you have tonight, or like, you know, whatever it might be <laughs> that you're, you're thinking about is going to influence that reading. Okay, so we take it actually during slow wave sleep, the final five minutes of the last episode of your slowly sleep. So during that time frame, you're unconscious, right? You can't manipulate the, your heart rate variability at that point, right? It's it is what it is. So um, so the then the that what we've seen and what the liter external literature supports is that this is a, a really great time frame to actually measure your heart rate variability. Okay, as it relates to next day capacity, that's what we're measuring. Um, that said, we do have I don't know if I can say this. We have a cool feature coming out around chronological versus biological. We might have to cut that out. I don't know. I need to <laughs> okay. check, but that is coming um, because we we can measure that too. Um, but uh, but yeah. But in terms of HRV, uh, that's the the timing when you take it's really important for a valid measure. Um, during the day, introduces all sorts of confounding variables that that influence the accuracy of that measurement. And oh, sorry. Well, I, I'm stoked about the chronological versus uh, biological. That's I know, I know. It's this will be a much less expensive. I, I know you've probably done all those tests too, the mm -hmm. epigenetics tests, and um, yeah, I have as well. So 
it definitely, um, you got to take well, three and average them. And yeah, it's and they're all good. over the place, right? You know, you, you can look at telomeres versus DNA methylation versus, you know, I'm like, I, I've, I've been 18, I've been 50. Like, <laughs> like, like, there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. I know, I know. It feels like, uh, yeah, a not, not an exact science by any means. No, exactly. and it doesn't, it doesn't preclude the fact that I could, you know, get hit by a bus tomorrow. So it's, uh, you know, there's yeah. that. There's so that as well. Mm -hmm. Back to HRV for a second. What what is it really, and why why like what's its importance? Why should we know about it? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, I mean, it's a really good indicator of your autonomic status. Um, so your heart rate, it's basically the the time interval between heartbeats, and your heart beats at very different intervals. And the more variation there is, um, the healthier you are. And, and that's basically, you know, while heart variability is a, a function of the heart, it actually originates in the autonomic nervous system. And to understand heart variability, you have to kind of understand, I guess, the, the mechanics of it. So um, your, your autonomic nervous system has two branches. It has the, has the parasympathetic and sympathetic. And the parasympathetic is the rest and digest. Sympathetic is, um, you know, the fight or flight. And they're both competing to send signals to your heart. Okay. So they're both competing. Both branches are competing to single signal to your heart. The more recovered you are, the more responsive your heart is going to be to both demands of your autonomic nervous system. Okay. So we're not saying, so whatever the external environment um, demands of your autonomic nervous system, the more recovered you are, the more responsive you're going to be to those demands. So you have to move, if you have to move out of the way of a moving car, for example, like the more recovered you are, it makes sense, the better you're going to be able to kind of respond to that moment of, you know, you just mentioned getting hit by bus. So that was in my brain, but <laughs> um, so the more recovered you are, um, the higher your heart rate variability, it would seem that the more you're going to be able to respond to the, the, all the demands in, in the environment. So that's kind of a a quick summary of how to think about heart variability. Um, the less recovered you are, the less responsive your heart is to the demands of the autonomic nervous system. So just imagine like it just being like lethargic almost, you know, like your heart's kind of lethargic. It's not like responsive to these demands. And as you can imagine, you know, your mental, emotional, you know, physical capacities in, in, in that moment are going to be, uh, you know, dampened or muted, right. When you're, when you're under recovered. So, um, so that's why heart variability is, is, you know, I think an interesting measure to, to really understand is that it gives you an indicator every day of the autonomic status. And, you know, it's, what's great is it's something that, you know, you can modify, you know, it, it's like something that you can, through your behaviors, um, you know, optimize, right? And, and I think that's the great opportunity. And that's why I think we should be measuring heart rate variability is, it's a great indicator of your mental, physical, emotional kind of state, right? How you're adapting to all these external stress. So it's a, it's a measure of your adaptive capacity. Um, and then it also helps you dial in and understand, you know, what behaviors are serving you and what behaviors are not. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really powerful marker and an incredible estimator of your overall health and wellness. That is so cool. It's so interesting that it's like the emotional and like psychological component it's insane. as well. It's, it's we're it so actually, interconnected. It, they really are. And I think that's what folks like don't realize is that, you know, it is, like, it's not just about your physical status. It's, it, it's actually more reflective. Your heart variability is actually more, it, it's, it's actually mediated by your psychological status. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think people don't realize that it's that strong of a, of a connection. So um, yeah. So really understanding, you know, what are the you know, what are the core psychological needs, you know, and, and this has been a, a subject of a lot of my academic research, you know, what are the, what are the things that we need to be building into our life in order to, um, you know, be able to respond to our environment in, in an optimal way. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not like a million needs, it's just a few needs really. And if we can build those into the infrastructure of our, of our, of our day and, and think about these things intentionally, um, you know, then we, we really start to, I think, get a, you know, get a sense of, actually can control our autonomic nervous system, which is really I, cool. I would love to get some like some actual concrete tips if you're willing to share some of those. Of um, but we're going to take a quick break uh, so we can do a commercial and I can run to the restroom because I've had too much coffee today, <laughs> which is probably not good for my HRV. <laughs> no, no, no. Coffee is not is not. Well, I can give you some data on coffee. But. <laughs> hey, ladies and gentlemen. 
Has COVID left you feeling a little off your performance game? Do you wonder if you're truly healthy? We did a lot. Training looks a lot different than it did a year ago, and having a tool that really gives us valuable insights to improve our health and performance was essential. Whoop and their new Whoop 3.0 has the technology and the science to evaluate your sleep, training, and recovery, and provide valuable insights on how to improve real health and performance. Their HRV and respiratory rate calculator has even been shown to predict a COVID-19 infection. Now, more than ever, we need real tools to monitor and improve our health. That's why we are excited to offer Complete Human listeners this great deal. Go to join.whoop.com slash complete human for a $30 discount. That's join.whoop.com slash complete human for a $30 discount. Hey, hey guys, Jana Breslin here again. Most of you have heard me speak on the benefits of beets. Beets are well known as a powerful superfood and help the body create nitric oxide, the miracle molecule that supports a healthy cardiovascular system and sexual function. As an athlete, the nitric oxide boosting benefits help me power through workouts better than any artificial pre-workout I've ever taken. Now, this is why we created Complete Human Res Beet. You get all of the benefits of organic beets with additional anti-aging support from fermented resveratrol. Resveratrol is a longevity gene activator and is something I have turned to for years to help support anti-aging and optimal health. If you're not a fan of the taste of beets, we've got you covered with our all-natural and delicious dark cherry flavor. I take Resbeet twice a day and I have to say I feel incredible. Head on over to store.completehuman.com and enter the code podcast at checkout. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back on the Complete Human podcast with Kristen Holmes, VP of Performance Science at Whoop, and we are about to get all of the lowdown <laughs> on what you guys need to do to optimize your brain so you can optimize your performance. Uh, Kristen, take it away. Oh, okay. Um, well, we, you know, no pressure. Oh uh, yeah, no pressure at all. No, there are definitely uh, kind of a, a suite of behaviors that um, influence our, you know, I, I don't know how much, or if you want me to get into kind of circadian alignment, but I, I think Absolutely. that, Please. yeah, it, it has just a, a, a huge impact on just our overall wellness. And, um, we definitely see, uh, you know, the degree to which we're able to align our internal clocks, like definitely influences all the markers that we track on whoop. So I think it's, it's definitely worth conversation. We actually, um, we, we just stood up a thousand person ar- uh, study with the U S army, the Arctic Alaska warfare unit. Um, so I'm really excited about, about the launch of this study, but it's, we're looking specifically at, you know, what are these markers of resilience? Um, and it's all around kind of circadian alignment and, you know, basically trying to put a kind of a scientific bow on, you know, these behaviors that are, are most influential on the physiological markers that we track. So um, we've definitely seen this, you know, in, in different pieces of literature that exist, but we're really trying to like put it all together in, in this one study. So it'd be really interesting, but What we already know is that, um, you know, the degree to which we align our behaviors with the, with the cues in the environment really dictate how our brain functions, you know, just how we metabolize food, you know, all the biological processes that you can imagine in, in your, in your system are influenced by these cues in the environment. So we want to create as little friction as possible for our body to do what it naturally wants to do. So some of the core behaviors are around, uh, you know, light exposure. So if you think about light exposure just as a behavior, um, light exposure has an, a massive impact on sleep, which has a massive impact on your ability to recovery, uh, recover, um, which is, of course, going to then influence your heart rate variability, right? Your ability to kind of adapt to your environment. So, you know, waking up in the morning, um, within 20 minutes, you need to get outside and, you know, look at the sky. Obviously don't, you know, look directly into the sun, but, um, (laughs) but, but that's, but that's the cortisol pulse, right? As soon as your eyes get into that low solar angle, they recognize that it's time to fucking go. It's time to like wake up. It's time to be alert. It it signals every cell in your body because every cell in your body has a clock, right? I don't think we appreciate the fact that every cell in our body has a clock. So this one behavior of going outside and viewing the, you know, kind of the, the, the sun on the horizon 
is, is a powerful cueing mechanism to basically wake your whole system up. And, and that then w- influences when you feel sleepy at night. So if we never give ourselves that exposure to the light in the morning, our body isn't sure when we need to go to bed. It's, it's not going to be releasing, um, building that sleep pressure and releasing the melatonin in a way that's optimized for you. So that one behavior is, is really important. <laughs> That's the first. I love that you say that. And and I've spoken at great length on the show about, you know, making sure that you do that and making sure that your first exposure to light is not your phone, uh, you know, because we we deal with all of the issues associated with blue light activation versus, you know, artificial versus um, light. But one thing that I'm curious about is there are obviously a percentage of people who wake up before the sun gets up. So as we talk about, you know, kind of like that, uh, that circadian cycle, how does that work for people? If if you're getting up two hours before the sun gets up, how is that impacting the rest of your day and how that melatonin switch turns on later on at yep. night? Yeah. So, you know, natural light obviously is the best to your point, but artificial light actually can do the same thing. Um, so, you know, those happy lamps, a hundred percent, an incredible investment. And, you know, I travel, I was just in Alaska, right? There's no sun, but I, I literally had no perturbations in my physiology because I kept myself on the East coast. So I was uh, literally awake three 30 in the morning, Alaska time. I, did exactly my same routine as I do here at home in terms of when, do, you know, basically the anchors, light exposure, meal timing, exercise timing, and sleep-wake timing. If you can do, those are basically the four behaviors I, we t- when we're talking about light exposure, one of the four. But those are the core four behaviors that you, that are serves as, serve as anchors to really, um, you know, if you're, if you're, we're talking about this through the lens of heart rate variability and autonomic control, uh, that is how you, you establish autonomic control, um, is you, you really stabilize those four behaviors. So light exposure, you know, again, it's not as good, but it's definitely, it's better than nothing. Um, and, and you need blue light during the day. So I think the whole concept, I know folks wear like a lot of blue light glasses and, um, but during the day, like you, you want your eyeballs in the, the, the natural light. It's really important. Um, and then obviously once the sun goes down, that's when you want the, the light. That's when you don't want exposure to screens and phones. And, um, or if you do, you want to make sure you have your filters on and your, you know, the, the blue light blocking glasses. So, to your point, it's it's not impeding that um, melatonin release, but um, but yeah, just any source of light, bathe yourself in as much light as humanly possible. Um, as soon as you know, within twenty minutes of, of waking up, um, will do the trick. Again, it's not as good, but um, you know, in the data that we've seen, it, it does actually. Um, you can follow that protocol and have very little physiological um, change. Uh, you know, versus when you're doing natural light. Um, I've seen this over and over again in the last five years. So, so first choice is to run naked down the street while the sun is up. And second <laughs> naked down the street. use use a happy light in the off chance that you get up before the sun comes up. Yeah. And you make another good point about just temperature and like feeling the ground with your bare feet. So if you're like literally like waking up and running naked, that is actually like amazing because your body, you know, just your skin, number one, the you know, the, it's, it's really, it's not as much about, it's not about your skin. Um, and you know, the sunlight, it's really about the retinas in your eye, right? Like that is, it's, mm-hmm. if you don't expose your eyes to the skyline and it's just your skin, that's not going to have the same impact as exposing your eyeballs to the sun, but the temperature, you know, your skin getting exposed to the temperature again is another cueing mechanism. And certainly, you know, having your feet on the ground, you know, you've probably talked about grounding, uh, before on this, mm-hmm. uh, podcast, you talked about, um, every, human performance element, which is so cool. But, um, but that's another really powerful mechanism, right? Cause you're, you're, you know, a, another cueing mechanism, um, you know, related to the environment that, you know, again, your body is going to pick up the temperature on the ground and that's going to be a source of insight and source of information for your, your clocks and your body. I kind of have a random question, but what about the difference between sleeping with like blackout curtains, not a blink of light is coming through your windows or anything versus kind of having your blinds open and like letting yourself wake up naturally with the light. I mean, do you have an opinion on that? I'm kind of curious. Yeah. Well, we're super sensitive to light at night, you know, so between the time, the, the, you know, between 11 and 4 AM, we really want to try to keep ourselves, um, you know, in, in dark, as a dark, a dark environment as possible if yeah. we're kind of on a normal sleep cycle. So shift work is kind of a different conversation and like a whole different <laughs> set of, you know, problems and, and things to think about, think about. But, you know, if you're going to bed, you know, I guess I take 
my situation. Like I, you know, start to wind down around 8.30, you know, I'll wash my face, read, you know, I'm basically sleeping by 9.30. Um, and then, and I always wear a, a light mask, a night mask, because I definitely notice huge differences between when I have a mask on and when I don't. Um, I don't have blackout curtains, but it's pretty dark, but light does kind of get through. Um, I have way more disturbances than when I wear a mask. Mm. And I typically around 4 a.m., I, I kind of end up taking my mask off and allow that kind of natural light in. And, and this is just my routine and I, and I may both do it every day, <laughs> um, but I, I kind of take my mask off and then just kind of wake up around 5.30, 5.20 ish, um, just naturally. So I, I do kind of like the, you know, after 4 a.m., just that exposure. Um, if, if, you know, and if you kind of train yourself to do that, I think that's probably the optimal way to, um, you know, to wake up is, is with a bit of natural light. Gotcha. So cool. Yeah. Um, uh, let's get, let's get in. Uh, HRV is such a fascinating conversation. I yeah. think sleep is so important, but I kind of want to get into just the device itself. Cause like yep. when I first got this, I'm like, there's no way that this little fucking thing does all of the things <laughs> that this app says that it does. How do you do that? Like, that is so cool. I know it, it's pretty amazing. So, you know, there's, there's sensors on the, you know, on the bottom of the you know device that, that basically pick up um, the, the blood flow and, um, you know, from that are, uh, you know, we're able to, you know, get all sorts of, you know, incredible signals that, that, and, and really, really good heart rate data that, you know, again, we're able to transform and, and be able to deliver all these insights about your body and from heart rate, you know, you get all these other, um, in, incredible, you know, bits of information, you know, we're able to, you know, uh, pull down the R intervals. We're able to, you know, understand respiratory rate We're you know, so there, it, we're able from, you know, just these three components, we're able to tell you so many things about your body. We're able to stage sleep. We also have an accelerometer, um, you know, so movement, you know, is also another input that is, you know, wildly helpful as it, as it relates to understanding where we can classify activities, right? We can classify up to 75 different activities. So we know just based on the accelerometer data, you know, whether you're weightlifting versus doing CrossFit versus running track and field versus just going out on a jog, you know, we're able to classify these, which is insane, right? That is crazy. But, um, yeah, data, data science. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think it, it is, it is really, it is really powerful. And, it, and I think that's where what's been so cool to be in the space over the last decade is just to see how good the technology has gotten, you know? And when I think about sleep, I mean, gosh, we're just about as good as a lab, you know, and, and, and our sleep validation study was the rigorous, most rigorous study done um, ever on a, on a wrist-worn device. And, you know, to, to be able to look at, you know, because basically most sleep labs are just looking at movement, right? Actigraphy. We have actigraphy. We are modeling your respiratory rate. We're modeling your heart rate variability. We're modeling your, you know, your heart rate. We're basically looking at all of these, these, you know, factors during sleep and, and, you know, understanding exactly what stage of sleep you're in, um, with, with, a with a high, high degree of, of accuracy. So it's, it is, it's incredible. I think what, um, we're able to abstract from, from these, you know, from these data that we're, you know, we're, we're tracking, you know, every 52 times a second. That's crazy. <laughs> so yeah. speaking of accuracy, I've, I've read, or I heard somewhere, and I wanted to ask if this is true, but whoop, you can actually, if let's say you're sick or you have an illness or maybe it's COVID people can, can see a shift in their data days before they're actually symptomatic. I'd love for you to touch on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's the, the research we've done around COVID has, has been like, frankly, like super epic and, and a lot of, um, you know, and, and, and really our, um, VP of data science and research, um, Emily Capitolupo, um, uh, one of my colleagues, she, you know, she has just really led this effort and has done a sensational job. And we actually just got a paper through, um, peer review, um, and it's, and it's published, um, it's a COVID-19 detection algorithm. So basically, you know, as soon as folks started, you know, we realized, holy shit, we're in a pandemic and this COVID data data is going to be really valuable. We basically yeah. put a, a, you know, a toggle on our, we put some information on our, on our, you know, inside the app that basically allowed folks to indicate if they were COVID-19 positive. Um, we also have a toggle that you, where you can indicate if you're sick. So we're able to look at these two data sets side by side. And the cool thing that we noticed is that, you know, with non-COVID sick, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, definitely trend in negative direction. So it's bi-directional. So you basically heart rate variability would decrease, resting heart rate increases. 
but respiratory rate stayed stable in non-COVID sick. In all the COVID-19 you know, sick folks who tested positive, we saw decreases in resting heart rate, increases in resting, sorry, decreases in heart variability, increases in resting heart rate, which we would typically see. But we also saw these massive jumps in respiratory rate. So in COVID sick, we saw these changes in heart variability and resting heart rate that were that were the same as, as non-COVID sick, but the difference between non-COVID sick and COVID sick was this huge jump in respiratory rate. So we were able to create an algorithm based on all of the COVID sick data we had. We we're basically able to have a COVID you know, prediction algorithm um, where we basically are 80% of the time, three days before symptom onset, we're able to accurately predict a COVID positive. That's and insane. I know, right? Yeah, so pretty, it's pretty wild. It's a, it is insane. And so basically inside the app, in our recovery pillar, you see all the four inputs that I've talked about, right? You see heart rate variability, you see resting heart rate, you see sleep performance, and you see respiratory rate. So when you click on respiratory rate, it basically shows you a band. And what's super interesting and, and frankly helpful about respiratory rate is that it's really stable. So as it relates to COVID, if you have COVID and you see a jump around, you know, what we see on average is a 17% jump relative to your baseline or like two to five standard deviations relative to your baseline. So if you see this jump, it basically, something lower track respiratory is, is happening, which is consistent with COVID. So you could have pneumonia, you could have, but, but you don't have flu, right? Like you have something, something else is going on. So it's definitely this moment where you should, you should self-isolate a hundred percent. Um, and you know, you should monitor your data and consider getting tested. Yeah. So, and, and with the respiratory rate, really, that's just measuring the number of breaths that you take in a specific time interval. And so your lungs yeah. are fighting to take in more oxygen with an increasing respiratory rate, which is complete, you know, so even with asymptomatic people, you guys are still seeing that the lungs are still fighting a little bit more to breathe. Totally. It, it just, it, it's, it's, it has already manifested in your lower respiratory tract, which yeah, then affects like how many breaths per minute you take. So yeah, I mean, we, what's great is that you have, when you wear whoop, you get this like insane baseline, you know, like I have a respiratory rate, like five years worth of like respiratory rate data. Right. So <laughs> when I, um, when I, um, so to, to know like what my baseline is, is, is kind of everything. And the same thing with heart rate variability and resting heart rate, you know, um, just in the cha changes of season, like, you know, I can, you know, whenever we go from like fall to winter, I definitely get like a little bit of seasonal affect disorder. Like I get a little, I'm like, holy Boston winter. I'm like, oh my God, here we go. Here. Like you have to like really rally, you know? And, mm -hmm. and I do find myself like my resting heart rate increases. My heart rate variability is a little suppressed. Like I can see it manifest in my data and it, it's because I have this baseline, right? So when I, when these perturbations happen, I, I can, I, I, I see it happening, you know, and it really is a reminder. All right. I gotta, I gotta really dial in. I gotta, you know, maybe ramp up, you know, my social interactions a little bit, like, you know, things that I know are going to help me help get me through this time period and get myself back on track. I can, you know, deploy those um, behaviors and be a little more intentional about, you know, how I'm tracking, but, but yeah, I mean, having insight um, into your data and having a really solid baseline, it's just, it's just an awesome way to kind of keep, keep your health in check. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what, did you, what is your HRV? It was 90 and then it went. Uh, mine was like, oh, I, I think I've been wearing mine for like about seven days now. Um, a few days ago, it was like 97, and today it was like 50. It wasn't that good. So I don't know that. <laughs> why, why are you looking at me like that? I don't know. It'd be interesting if it, if you guys could like send a little alert, like, hey, your data is suggesting maybe you could have a cold coming on or maybe some flu symptoms. Be mindful. Maybe, you know, be aware. Yeah, we, we definitely, um, we do give you that feedback. So once you've been wearing it for you know, and we have enough confidence that we've collected enough heartbeats and we can say something meaningful about your specific data, we definitely will send notifications like that. Like, hey, you know, you're trending in, uh, in, in one day, a single day of a, you know, let's say, so you're probably green and then today you're at the lower bounds of yellow. Is that accurate? Uh, I think so. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay. So, you know, one day I wouldn't, but now if you, you know, think too much about it, but if you've got, you know, tomorrow you're again, lower bounds of yellow the next day, you know, mid yellow, that means your body is struggling to adapt to right. something. 
right? So it could at that point, you know, you've got a couple of days, you know, Whoop is is probably going to say, hey, you're looking a little rundown. Um, you know, consider you know, modifying your volume and intensity or, um, you know, it's, it's cause it, when you think about the factors that influence recovery, it's very much related to sleep, right? Mm -hmm. It's not a linear relationship. So it doesn't always mean you could be getting great sleep, but your body still is struggling to adapt because maybe you're not dealing with relationship stress as well as you could be, or, um, you know, you're just, you know, feel like you're wallowing in your job a little bit and you're just kind of feeling like, you know, or, you know, it could be the, the season, uh, you know, it could be too much training, uh, too much load relative to your capacity. So really overreaching in, in kind of a non-functional way. So there's, you know, a few things that it could be. So to, to, to notice that your, your body's not adapting is this really powerful source of insight. And then you can really start to look at, okay, I know that I'm not adapting. What are the factors that actually influence adaptation? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, sleep behavior, recovery behavior, training behavior, and then it's purpose, efficacy, control on the psychological side. So those are the main factors that influence motivation, attentional capacity, effective effort, you know, arousal, everything. So, so if you understand those factors and you can kind of look at your data, then you can start to, you know, kind of by process of elimination, start to dial in on, on what actually might be happening. Mm -hmm. And I bucket in recovery, I bucket, you know, stress, stress mitigation. So all the sorts of modalities we would deploy to kind of help us manage stress. So whether that's, you know, cold and heat thermogenesis or, um, you know, resonance breathing or, you know, box breathing, you know, different breath work, um, you know, I, nutrition's bucketed in there. And then I also bucket, um, Orgy. you know, uh, <laughs> hydration. What's that? Orgy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sex. I mean, I could talk, I I'm actually, we're literally publishing, I'm working on a paper right now looking at sex behavior and how that influences heart rate variability. So well, stay so tuned. Weird. We've I know I, I want it so bad yeah. to come out for Valentine's day, but I don't think we're going to finish it. We're just like, I'm dealing with a bunch of Australians and, um, <laughs> they're taking their time. No, I'm totally kidding. I, I think I've been holding up. I've been holding the show up. It's been me. So you've got a bad. bunch of guys down under who prohibiting you from talking about down under. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is essentially what is happening here. <laughs> awesome, yeah. Awesome. But there's a lot to say uh, about, about sex behavior for sure. Oh, so we talk about that all the time on the show is, is just the value of that. And yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for the whoop notification be like, Hey, you know, numbers are a little <laughs> off time to get laid. Yeah, no, no, no. The, I, I mean, I can talk about this if you want. Um, By all means, let's go for it. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, this is definitely really fascinating on a lot of levels because you've got, uh, you know, I think when you think about it from a biological standpoint, you know, you've got, you know, sex is important, right? Like it tells our body that we're, were relevant, right? Like as soon as you stop having sex, like all of a sudden your body's like, okay, I guess you're not relevant anymore, right? Like when we think about the three mm -hmm. things that are most important, you know, fighting, you know, food and we're not a PG podcast. <laughs> I know we're not a family podcast. This is music to my ears because I'm always like, <laughs> I'm always trying not to swear. Like that's literally, it takes up way too much space in my brain. So no, no, I no, think... let, let them fucking fly. Just go. <laughs> No, but um, so I think, you know, that's well documented that we've got these three kind of evolutionary poles, right? And, um, and, and while we're evolving in a way that, you know, some of the aspects of, of, of that are, are um, you know, muted, um, I, I think generally speaking, like that's still in all of us, right? So when we don't have the ability to kind of express those things or we choose not to, I think it's safe to say that parts of our, our not just our soul, but you know, parts of us actually die, right? So I, I think sex, you know, is, is, is really important, but I think there's a lot of new research on, you know, there, I think there's a way to do it that, you know, amplifies um, your health and wellness. And there's ways to do it, do it that don't necessarily amplify health and wellness. So I think that's a really interesting, there, there are a lot of interesting distinctions uh, between kind of what is, is, uh, really an upgrade and, and what is actually a drain of, on your energy. Um, and that's really what this study with um, uh, Central Queensland University is, is really trying to unpack is, you know, what is optimal? You know, what does self-stimulation look like versus sex with a partner? What is sex with, uh, you know, a, you know, a, acquaintance or, you know, <laughs> casual sex versus sex with a partner? Like, you know, they're all very different. What does sex look like, you know, um, during the day versus before bed, you know, how does it influence sleep architecture? Um, so yeah, these are all questions where, that were- Where does the caller at? fit in in that? 
Um, yeah, well, there is, well, if we talk about psychological needs, control actually is one of the core psychological needs we have. Um, so it's, <laughs> so you could probably, that probably fits in that bucket somewhere. Well, totally. It, it wasn't, it, it wasn't a just pervy question. I think it makes sense. It's like, you, you know, know the, the need for control. I mean, yep. nipple clamps, that's just, that's arbitrary. <laughs> that's gratuitous. But the caller actually, you know, plays into this conversation from a scientific group. <laughs> I think that's so. so I think, fascinating I think though. Awesome. Very. I'm really curious to, to read that when that comes out. I know I'm, I'm like pretty, it's one of the papers that I, we've got like, I don't know. I would probably get about 15 manuscripts right now, like in, in the work. So lots and like just buckets of research uh, coming out in 2021. So I'm like super pumped because 2020 was basically laying a lot of this groundwork and, and, and years prior to as well. So, but I think this is the year that we'll actually like publish a lot of this stuff and be able to say some really cool things that have never been said before. Um, and one of it definitely, this is a, a kind of an epic study that's not, it's really never been done. So, and we just have okay. a huge number. So it's just like looking at, you know, it's not just 13 people, right? Like we're able to, and, that, and that's what's great about like a lot of the WHOOP research is that we're, you know, we've got a thousand U.S. soldiers. We got, you know, these are huge, massive as it relates to research, this is massive numbers, you know. But, awesome. um, I, actually, this is something that uh, we might just remind me that after we end this podcast, we're going to talk about something else that uh, I think would fit well into this. Okay. Uh, so what's next for WHOOP? You guys are kind of taking over the data world. And, and I know that this data is so valuable, but where do you go from here? And, and I think I will be honest. The first thing that I thought about WHOOP was I've got an Apple watch. It tells me the time I get my text messages. Like now I've got to wear something else. It doesn't even tell me the time. Like what good is this now that I've had it on? It's awesome. But like, do you guys evolve into more of an integrated device or does this stay kind of what this is? Yeah. I mean, I think integrating is, is really interesting and, you know, we integrate with Strava and, you know, we definitely integrate into other platforms. Um, they ingest our data. So there, there's definitely a world where we see, you know, really strategic integrations, um, with other platforms, you know, Apple, like, you know, I can see health data somehow integrating the two. Um, so that's a possibility for sure. Um, you know, I think integrations, like I said, are, are really important, but, um, I think for us, it's about building features that help, um, folks gain more control over their autonomic nervous system. You know, I, I kind of go back to that, go back to that principle of adaptive capacity. Like if we can adapt in a, you know, to external stress in a, in a functional way consistently over time and, you know, deploy the behaviors that enable that or help guide our members toward the behaviors that enable that. I think that's like the keys of the kingdom, you know, and there's really no platform that, that, that really does that. And, and I will say that, you know, I wear a, you know, like a nice watch every now and again, like if I'm getting whatever dressed up, but I think for me, When's like the last time I you did that, <laughs> I know, right. Um, I actually, I was in, um, uh, it's been, it's been a few weeks now. <laughs> a few weeks. It's, it's like months, years, maybe. I know. I, <laughs> we haven't I know. Pants in almost 12 months. <laughs> yeah. Talk about like dying inside. Um, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, but, um, yeah. So uh, now I'm like distracted. Um, the watch, sorry. Yes. No, just kidding. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of like the fact that it's not dinging at me. Right. Like, I mean, I'm definitely someone who like, I'm not all over my phone all the time. So I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm not, um, like, you, you know, I just joined Instagram in February or March. I don't even know. Like, I, you know, like I, I'm just not like, that hasn't been a big part of my world for, for very long. So I'm just not, conditioned, I guess, to like go to my phone all the time. So I kind of like the fact that it's just passively collecting information in the background. And then I can kind of choose when I, when I go into the whoop platform to be able to see what's happening. Um, but I think in terms of the future and people just need to decide, you know, how they want to use the real estate on their body. But, um, but I do think there's a lot of opportunity for whoop to be worn in other parts of the body. So I, I see that as a potential future, um, for us. And then, um, you know, where it just kind of disappears on the body. Um, I definitely see that happening. Um, and then I, I think, again, just these really core features that help um, folks understand, you know, how to deploy a breathing protocol to really influence heart rate variability. So using the research that we've done, you know, in with USC and Dr. Mar Mather's lab, you know, with Dr. Andrew Huberman, I mean, with Stanford, like we're doing a lot of fucking like epic research on 
just breath work, right? And, and how different types of breathing protocols influence your sleep architecture and, and actually move the needle um, toward, you know, more autonomic, more, more autonomic control. So, you know, building these features that are inside the app that really, again, drive you toward the behaviors that um, enable, um, you know, this, this kind of optimal, you know, control of the autonomic nervous system, I think is to me where we should spend a lot, all of our energy <laughs> in the near future. We talk a lot about bio-optimization, what that means for human life expectancy, you know, thinking that if we start to optimize all of these features and we have data in, in this constant feedback loop, real-time data, what does that do to our life expectancy? Do you guys have any expectation on how maybe it doesn't increase life expectancy, but how it increases health span? Yeah, I, I'd love to do some like modeling around that. Um, and I, I think that's probably something that we could do. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I, you know, I, obviously our quality of life is going to get better. I mean, I think you look at folks today I and mean, we were talking about this for the podcast, like, you know, I think folks in their forties, you know, look like they're in their thirties, you know, like it just, if you, if you're sleeping well, if you're, you know, not drinking a lot of alcohol, if you're drinking a lot of water, you know, you're, you're eating nutrient dense foods, you're, you know, you have some sort of breathing protocol or, you know, meditation framework where you can, you know, direct and your thoughts and your attention and, and, you know, a way that feels good. You know, if you've got a lot of purpose in, in your life and, and you're driving toward that and you've got good, you know, social connections, like shit. I mean, I think you can, you can really, um, I think really dictate your, you know, your, your longevity. Um, so yeah, I don't know about Dave Asprey, you know, 180, but, um, but I, but I do see a future where, you know, we're, and I guess this is where we started the podcast of, okay, how do we apply our effort? You know, what are the, the things that actually matter the most as it relates to longevity, as it relates to optimizing health and, and how does this feedback actually enable that? You know, and that's what this biofeedback really, the goal of it is really just to help, I think at a foundational level, live your values with as much joy and energy as possible. I mean, that's really what this insight I think enables is, is, Hey, I just want to, I want to show up every day. I want to be as available emotionally, spiritually, mentally, physically, as I, as I possibly can be. And I know that if I don't understand my heart rate variability and how that's trending, I'm just missing a piece of the puzzle, a really fucking important piece of the puzzle, you know? And, and I think that's what these data are about. It's, it's not about being, you know, ha just, trying to get a great HRV necessarily. Like it's more about, okay, how can I, how can I set up my life that feels really good? Um, that I know is, is helping me, you know, do what I want to do, you know, which is really just be available for life. Mm -hmm. Well, I like it's pretty spot you... on. I love that. Yeah. It might be a, uh, might be a good way to end that. It sounds good to me. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, Kristen, we're offering a deal for all of the complete human listeners, but, um, it, it, you know, I know you said you just joined, uh, Instagram, like in March, um, <laughs> I did. how's that I going for you, by the way? I don't, I don't even know. I'm, I'm a little bit of a mess. I, you know, I just like try to post like, you know, my data when I'm traveling and, um, you know, when I've done intermittent fasting and I notice something in the data, like, you know, just try to help folks understand what, what their data means. And, you know, I post a lot about various research that that comes out that I think is is really is helpful for folks. So it's a lot of human performance stuff. Cool. Well, we love that. So how can people find you on Instagram? Um, so Kristen um, underscore Holmes 2126. So Kristen underscore Holmes 2126. Um, and then Whoop has an awesome Instagram as well. Um, and then I have published a ton of stuff on the locker. Um, so that's whoops platform so if you go to whoop.com the locker there's a ton of awesome content on there as well um where you know I, I break down basically how to think about your data and how to optimize your sleep and you know what recovery modalities to think about as it relates to hrv um how to stimulate the vagus nerve and you know get control of your parasympathetic branchy nervous system stuff like that so All that's cool stuff i love that i feel like we gotta have yeah. you back this is great so I far <laughs> i know i feel so like we insightful. just got the surface, but, um, yeah, there, there's definitely a lot of really cool insights there. Awesome. And then obviously your podcast, I, I can't wait to like dig into some of your episodes. Cause you've had like incredible people on. We do our best. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's tools for a better life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. That's cool. really cool. 
All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, we will put all of Kristen's information in the show notes. Make sure to follow her on Instagram, even though she's a newbie. Uh, we will support her. <laughs> I'm uh, judging. Check out the locker and whoop. Uh, obviously, you know, if, if the quality of science that she's brought to this uh, interview is any indication, you guys are going to find some kick-ass stuff on the whoop site. Yes. Uh, we've been wearing ours for about a week, so we'll do some follow-ups on ours just to see how things are going. Uh, we're going to have a little competition here to see who's got the, uh, the better data after oh, like a month. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then we'll definitely talk to more, uh, we'll talk to, to Kristen more about sex after we hit the end button. So you guys will just won't be a part of that conversation. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in for another edition of the complete human podcast with your host, Jana Breslin and Evan DeMarco. We will see you next week. Bye guys.